will have Dr. Uh, Hunt talk to us about making your 1000 level course um, a place for student success. So uh, Dr. Lauren Hunt is assistant professor of Horn at Utah State University, where she has worked since August uh, 2019. At USU, Dr. Hunt teaches courses in ethnomusicology and career development, as well as applied French horn and chamber music. Dr. Hunt has taught extensively around the globe and has given master classes and recitals in many cool places, <laughs> such as Belize, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, and many cities throughout the United States. Uh, Dr. Hunt has adjudicated the International Horn Competition of America, the Mid-South Horn Workshop, solo workshop and Illinois All State Editions. Prior to her current position, Dr. Hunt spent five semesters on faculty at Illinois State University and winner of the International Horn Competition of America in 2013, Dr. Han can be heard on a recently released album of Beethoven's Chamber uh, Works for Winds. Uh, on the Nexos label. She holds a Bachelor's of Music in Horn Performance from the New England uh, Conservatory, a Master of Music in Horn Performance from Yale University, and a Doctor of Musical Arts degree in Horn Performance from the University of Georgia, where she was a Presidential Fellow. <laughs> so, wow. And uh, we're very lucky to have you here. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. being here. Um, as she introduced uh, me, I'm Lauren Hunt, and I'm an assistant professor in the music department. So probably similarly to many of you listening, some of my first classroom teaching experiences were when I was already on the ground. I didn't have um, a TA experience as a classroom teacher, just as an applied faculty um, TA position where I was teaching private lessons. So a lot of the things um, that I'm going to share today are things that I've found in my own search for how to be a good classroom teacher, despite not having that training um, beyond just my field of study. So um, today we're talking about strategies for success in the 1000 level classroom. And there's a couple unique challenges to this level of student. One of them is that freshmen don't know how to be college students yet. They don't know how to wake up on time without mommy waking them up. They don't know how to like get dressed. They don't know how to turn in things on time. So um, even though we, we, we have to have expectations for them, we have to also help them build those expectations for themselves and find ways to succeed. Another challenge of this level of course is that the subjects themselves are often really general. A lot of times we have a ton of content to get through. Sometimes they're fulfilling general education requirements so students feel like the topic of the course is not relevant to their interests. Um, but we have to get through the content because these courses are often prerequisites for upper level courses that may be required for their major. And uh, another challenge is that a lot of times these are large enrollment courses, intro level classes with sometimes even hundreds of students in them. So it's really easy for the students who don't know how to college yet to get kind of lost in the mix. And so I hope that um, attending this presentation today and, and the thoughts I'm going to share with you can help you find some interesting ways to um, build success strategies for these students in your classes. So as I said, um, I am like many of you in that um, we are not always the people that are, we're teaching in our courses, right? We're a little bit different. Most of us have doctorates. That's maybe not the path that most of our students are going to take. Uh, we were generally excellent students. Probably many of us had 4.0 or close to it in undergrad. We weren't the ones not turning in a final paper. Um, we also all see our content as essential. No matter what class we're, take, we're teaching, we think it's important, even if the students could not care less. 
and we don't always understand the individual challenges that students are having. And this is really amplified by the pandemic, but some of these have persisted before then. For example, they're not prepared at their high school level. Their teachers didn't have deadlines. Maybe they went to a really small rural school where they just didn't have the opportunities of other um, people. There's personal challenges going on. And all of this is amplified by the pandemic because again, like online school, there's very little accountability here. Um, and those of us who are maybe older have not maybe had experience as online learners, so it's hard to understand the unique challenges of that perspective. So I was coming into being a teacher here without having much preparation pedagogically. I knew my content really well, but I just didn't have strategies for teaching it. And um, in addition to that, I was one of these faculty outliers, right? I didn't, I, I couldn't really sympathize with the student that was not motivated to turn in a, a large scale assignment. So when I came here, as well as in my previous position at Illinois State, I've really sought out a lot of resources and all of you are here watching today because you've sought out a lot of these same resources. Um, and so what I'm, the strategies I'm gonna share with you today are things that I've gleaned from attending a number of workshops and also taking, um, the AQ course. And some of the people here in the room today were mentioning this uh, before we got the technology figured out. Um, but in case you're not familiar, this is a, a year-long online course in effective online teaching practices sponsored by the Association of College and University Educators. And um, I was in the cohort of this that finished in spring 2021. And it's sponsored by ETE through a competitive application process. And so in this course, each week you learn about a new topic, you look at it being kind of hypothetically presented, and then you find a way to implement it into your own course. So a lot of the things that I'm going to share with you today are things that I'd been working on before that course and changes that I made to my course while taking the AQ class. And the things that worked, I stuck with, and the things that didn't, I've eliminated. So I hope that there's a few things here that will be helpful for you moving forward. So I've divided the ideas that I'm going to share into, oh, I forgot one thing. Um, but the, basically these are takeaways that I've had and I will save all the citations and resources for the end of the presentation. So if you're interested in reading more or finding the link to apply for this, um, those will be on the final slide. So um, as I was gonna say, I've divided into three main topics. So one is about organizing your course in classroom. There's some things we can do already now and in the summer to prepare our fall courses for student success. Um, then I'm gonna talk about exams. And finally, I'm gonna talk about other types of assignments and assessments. Within the organizational structure, I also have three categories. One is having a consistent structure. One is connecting students with the syllabus. And the third is create a community in your classroom. So to start it off, let's talk about structure. How can we structure our classes for student success? And the first step to doing this is to think about how the course is organized as a whole. And some of us think of our courses very linearly which makes sense sometimes from a content-oriented perspective. But this can be really challenging from a student perspective. If you haven't engaged with the content yet, you don't know what to expect. You don't know how much homework there is going to be. You don't know how difficult it's going to be for you. So making some kind of organizational structure for your course will aid students in understanding what to expect, which will aid in things like time management skills and hitting those deadlines instead of missing them since it's at the same time every week or every unit. Um, so in, a, in thinking also what types of subjects or ideas are gonna be covered in each section, each unit or module or week of the class. Maybe you, my cl world class is a world music class, so it's geographically oriented. So there are certain topics that we cover in each geographical region. In prior semesters, I've also taken a thematic approach. So for example, music and dance would be one unit and then music and religion would be another unit. But still you could expect the same types of places being discussed and the same number of different regions being discussed. So thinking about how you can structure them in this way. And this will really help students, as I said, with their time management and preparation for assessment. 
Um, for example, in my world music class, I have five units. And as I said, these are geographically oriented in the co course's current iteration. So within each unit, we do two classes about culture and how music fits into that. Two classes about music theory, so kind of getting more nitty gritty. Um, then we do one class about kind of contemporary trends, um, international influences on that region's music. And then we have a quiz at the end of the unit, followed by a, a final project work day. So having this consistent structure allows students to know what to expect. They also know what they can look forward to. Some of them are much more interested in popular styles than traditional styles. So then they're, oh, we're going to get through this boring stuff to get to the class that I actually am interested in. And it also helps them think about how their work will be structured. They know when the quiz is going to happen. It's not a mystery. They know kind of how many classes they have to pull together the, the thought process towards studying for the quiz. And they also know about how much homework they're going to have. In each unit, I have two readings, each of which is 10 to 15 pages. And so even though it might fall differently into the unit structure based on the exact content of the reading, they still know that they need to budget about the same amount of time every week to complete those reading assignments. So there's a lot of this type of thing that we can do ahead of time to make our course with a structure that will make sense to students. But then the question comes, how do we present this structure to them? And obviously that comes through the syllabus. Uh, one challenge that first year students have often is they're not familiar with the concept of a syllabus. Perhaps some high school teachers use a syllabus, but I know when I was in high school, that was not the experience that I had. It was just like, here's what we're doing, here's what we're doing, go. Um, so a lot of students aren't really familiar with this concept. It's a new thing to them in college. And I found a lot of my first year students don't even realize that policies might be different in different classes. Um, I do accept late work in my class and a lot of students fail to take advantage of that policy because other faculty members in my department don't. And so they just think, oh, no late work in college. So we have to find ways to communicate this clear with students. The info dump on the first day of classes is a hard way for anyone to process and remember things. So there's a few suggestions of how we can make sure these policies are really clear to students and they understand how things work in your class. So one of these that's, I think, pretty common in pedagogical literature that I've encountered is doing an activity in the first class meeting or maybe sometime during the first week to connect with the syllabus. I personally use a syllabus scavenger hunt. And so what that looks like is it's kind of like a quiz almost, but it's low stress. It's just a completion grade. You turn something in with your name on it, you get the points. So it incentivizes looking for the right answers without having the stress of, of a bad grade come with it. Um, and it just has a few different questions and hypothetical scenarios. Your friend has ADHD and needs more time on a test. What should they do? Um, and so it makes students think about these real life scenarios. I also do this in a small group, even though it's a completion grade. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that helps build community on my next slide. As I mentioned, the info dump is not a great way for students to retain the knowledge. So I found that it's really helpful to follow up about course policies regularly during the semester. So this I do when I'm noticing a problem. Like for example, certain students can start not showing up to, to class. Um, I'll revisit the course policies or I notice a lot of people didn't turn in an assignment. I wanna remind them about that late work policy. Um, or a student on my midterm survey that I give out to students to get feedback from me as a teacher, they say, I wish you would put the PowerPoints on Canvas. Well, they're all there. Let me show you where. So going back to these policies, revisiting them, um, perhaps doing another activity with the syllabus mid-semester or at various points, or just having this as part of your announcements, coming back to these, making sure that people understand. And if you have colleagues in your department where a lot of the same students might be in your classes, maybe even pointing out what the differences between those policies are. Um, I know in my class, there's like two other classes that all the freshmen are in. And so a lot of times when I go back to these types of 
of ideas and point out um, which things are my policies, then I say, oh, well, in, in Professor Chinette's class, it's going to be like this. And in Dr. Baker's class, it's going to be like this. And then they can really start to keep straight what's happening. I also, one thing that I learned from the connections class training um, was about providing resources for students alongside the policies. So instead of seeming punitive, you must come to class. If you're sick, it's your own problem. Providing resources so students who are really struggling know that they can go to the DRC. They're not alone in trying to struggle through a class that maybe they have a disability that's impacting their work. If they're sick and they need to see a doctor and they don't know how to do that, being away from their parents for the first time, knowing about the Student Health Center, I found I brought this up the other day in my world music class, and I would say less than half of the students knew that the Student Health Center existed. So even if we feel like, oh my gosh, I say this so many times, there's still a lot of students that they're not paying attention, maybe they're on their phone under the desk or whatever. Revisiting these policies frequently is going to make it sink in, and even if it's boring for a few students that did pay attention, we need to find a way to reach the students that are really struggling. So these are a few of the strategies I've used. And speaking of students that are struggling, the last part of the organizational portion of what I'm talking about is about creating community in your course. A lot of our freshmen don't yet have an on-campus community. They, especially if they are from, let's say, a, a rural area or a small community, they may have known everyone in their town growing up. And then this is really scary and intimidating to be here on campus. And it's hard to make friends if you've never had to meet new people before. Um, so I would encourage in a 1000 level course that creating community is a very important part of building student success. Um, as we know, these courses are also prerequisites for many upper level courses. They'll encounter the same students. So building community in these entry level courses helps create a better environment for their entire collegiate experience, not just for your one course. Um, I used to teach also a senior level course in the music department. And it was amazing how siloed the students were. In a 40 student course, they'd had all the same classes for four years. They still didn't know the names of most of the other students in the class. They would sit, you know, all the singers with each other and all the, you know, the band kids together and all the piano kids together. And I found that really disappointing. If we at the 1000 level can really encourage that intermingling, then the students can really find their people and they'll know who they want to work with on group projects in the future. It's really going to create a much better community in the department as a whole. So one of the ways I start off by doing this is by learning student names. Now that's maybe not possible depending on the enrollment of your class, but I've found even though I'm not great at names, I can learn about up to 50 students in the class. Beyond that gets a little bit challenging, but up till there, if I really study, I can. So one thing I like to do is I create a couple different small scale in class group activities that are just um, completion grade based. For those the first week or so of school, there's at least like one small thing per class. One example of this would be the syllabus scavenger hunt. So before we break out into groups to do those small scale activities, I'll have about a quarter or a third of the class introduce themselves, you know, standard things like name, pronouns, major, hometown, fun fact. It's pretty fast. I take notes on things, and then as they do their little activity, I sit there and creepily study them so that I can learn their names. But it's proven really effective. Um, students' feedback to me in my midterm and final surveys have been that it really makes students feel like they're valued a lot more. Um, and I know that it also goes a long way when I call on a student in class who maybe didn't have their hand raised. If I use their name rather than, hey, you, um, it definitely creates a more positive um, feeling for learning and participating in the discussion. And as I've mentioned a couple times already, these low state group activities also really work well to build these peer to peer networks. This is especially important if you're teaching a large enrollment course where you just cannot learn every student's name. So the way that I do these, we always hear these complaints about students, I hate group projects, blah, 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 blah. And um, what I found is when I attach grades to group projects, that's when people get upset. Just doing something together, people don't usually seem to mind. So the strategy that I've taken is by doing completion-based 
um, grading. So they're not stressed about the group project. Everyone can put in their own ideas into the assignment. And it encourages this kind of collaboration and discussion because we're not worried about necessarily the right answer. We're just discussing, figuring things out. And doing these at the beginning of the semester is one of my favorite things because then they start to build that community when no one knows each other. They can find study groups for exams later on. And when they're absent, they can get notes. And as I said, these are gonna be people that they're gonna see down the road. So while later in the semester, I often let students choose their own groups for small discussions. At the beginning, I always assign groups. Sometimes I do it by mixing ages and majors and other times I do it by like majors or I'll do it alphabetically, just finding different ways to scramble the students up so they're forced to interact and get to know as many of their peers as possible. So this kind of brings me to attendance. I teach in-person classes. Some of you probably teach online classes where attendance is not actually anything. Um, but I found that requiring attendance does lead to better student successes. A lot of times students really feel like they learn equally well on Zoom as in person. And I have found, like I collected some data last semester of students who were out for like COVID quarantine and stuff and how they felt about their performance leading up to exams versus their performance on exams. And every single time they felt like their abilities were the same as the students who attended all of the classes, but their performance on the exams was much lower. So. This is what I found. I know not everyone has the same philosophy, um, but I really do feel like the, the distraction outside the classroom can be really significant and hinder student successes. Um, it also builds community among students. If you're doing an in-class discussion in small groups, and then you've got like one person alone on Zoom or two or whatever, whoever's out that day for COVID, those people aren't having an equivalent experience. And the students who happen to sit near each other, maybe they're doing an informal discussion. Hey, turn to your peer and say three things you learned from the reading assignment. Um, you're starting to talk to other students around you, even if it's the same few students that you sit next to. We're starting to build that community. Um, oh, I already covered that, sorry. <laughs> and one important thing in the professional workplace is showing up. We all know like if you don't show up, you're not gonna keep your job for long, right? Even if the work that you do when you're there is great. And we need to help prepare students for pro professional expectations, which includes showing up. And so having a grade for attendance has helped me emphasize those professional expectations for my students. A similar challenge is getting students to do their homework and reading assignments. So I've taken a very similar approach here. I do completion grades based on reading guides. So reading guides are what I call a series of questions based on the readings that covers like the 10 most important concepts covered in a reading assignment. And it's very easy to find the information, but it helps students direct their reading. A lot of our students struggle with reading comprehension. I'm sure we've all encountered that. And so having these reading guide questions helps them focus in on what's important from what they're seeing here. I've gotten feedback from the students in the 1000 level class that I teach that this was extremely helpful and translated into their other courses where they weren't provided reading guides because they knew how to think about what they were looking at. Um, I also find that it's similar to, you know, exam scores and attending on Zoom where you're like folding your laundry instead of taking notes, right? Um, people feel like, oh, it's just a reading assignment. I'll do it later. Or they say, oh, well, it's not a big deal if I didn't do that reading assignment. But as we all know, as faculty members, it is really important or we wouldn't assign that. And so giving that completion grade really gives them those points on their grade to incentivize this good learning behavior. So these are my thoughts about how we can structure our course from the outset and in the classroom to create a better learning environment for our 1000 level students. My last two thoughts on this are regarding exams and other kinds of um, exam based or question based assessments and then project based assessment. So 
Before doing all this research and implementing it into my course, I just did multiple choice quizzes because I felt like that was, okay, this is an entry level class. I just need to see, do they know the basic facts? And I don't have time at the, that time I had one section of 70 students. I don't have enough time to go through and grade like a bunch of people's short answer questions where like maybe their grammar is so weak. I don't even know what they're trying to say. That was my perspective before. So I was doing multiple choice questions, but I've actually moved away from that recently. And there's a few reasons why. I was thinking a lot about what I'm hoping students get out of my course. Even though it's an entry level course, it's required for all music majors, but it's something that's not, doesn't feel relevant to most of them. If you're gonna be a classical pianist, why do you need to know about Mongolian throat singing? The answer is probably you don't. Right? And, but yet this course is required for a classical pianist. And this is an important unit in, of study in, in the course. But thinking more about the content of my course and what I'm hoping students get out of it, I realized that what I want them to get out of it is a broader understanding of the world. And I think a lot of us have that same feeling about our entry level courses. Maybe there's certain, um, curriculum we need to get through to prepare them for those upper level classes. But a lot of it is critical thinking, right? And thinking through that process instead of a fact-based approach took me to a really different place in terms of the way that I structure my assessments. Instead of thinking about, here's my content for this unit, and here's the 10 most important things. So I'm gonna quiz them on the 10 most important things. I say, what do I want them to remember five or 10 years from now? I want them to remember things about how to interact with people who are not from their same culture. What is cultural appropriation? How can I listen to something I've never heard before and not say, ew, that's ugly or weird, you know, potentially leading to some conflicts. And then thinking from there to how can I assess that? And so what I've ended up with in this class is a open-ended question worth more than half of the, the points for each exam. I asked students to recall three important large scale facts they learned in this unit and then share some details about those facts. So this might not work in every field, but thinking this way, at first I was like, I don't know about this because I need to learn this and this and this, but actually it's been really illuminating. I can see what students feel is most valuable for their own knowledge. I stay away from things like, in what year did blank happen? Which is not really something they're gonna to need to know 10 years from now off the top of their head. And instead go to these conceptual ideas that really do influence their thinking. It also moves them up Bloom's taxonomy. So we all know Bloom's taxonomy. Oh, let me skip ahead. Here we are. Bloom's taxonomy. If we're asking people to answer multiple choice questions, usually we're kind of on the lower level of this. Remember, maybe we're at understand. We're probably not up to apply or analyze, right? But by asking them to think of what's most important and then come up with that themselves rather than you tell them that, it really makes them go higher on this taxonomy to think about critically what am I taking away from this course? So instead of just saying facts about the nomadic lifestyle of the Mongolian traditional people, they're thinking about how that Mongolian um, nomadic lifestyle has impacted the music and what that means to them. So it may seem intimidating to do this in terms of grading, but it's really not that bad, I promise you. Since it's factual based, you can still just quickly check or X on each thing. If you have a TA, that person can definitely help because it's, it's factual. It's not really something that's up to interpretation. And then you can focus on the ones that maybe are borderline from your, if, from your TA's grading. But even in my course of 45 students, it really only takes me like less than an hour to grade their exams with this format. The only challenge here is the students don't know how to study for these kinds of exams. So there's a couple ways that I found to help students prepare for non-traditional exam formats. And honestly, I think that they, some of them really need this help to prepare for traditional exams as well. So one thing is to offer practice opportunities. 
Of course we can give a practice exam, but there's more to it than that. Another thing you could do is have an exit ticket. So I've done before where, okay, turn to the person next to you and share three important things you learned last class, go. Or write a paragraph explaining what you learned today and turn that in as an exit ticket in order to leave class. This can be an easy way to take attendance. It can also be a completion grade activity, again, giving a few points for participating if you have participation courses or just having that little feel good of like, you know what, you, did, you tried, here's some feedback on how you could express yourself more clearly or you know, you're a little off track, here's the direction to go. Getting that feedback, especially for the students that are too nervous to come to office hours is great. Um, and incentivizing with, with participation points or completion grade is always great um, in getting students engaged with this type of activity. Since I teach a music class, so one portion of every exam or quiz is always going to be a listening identification. Probably many of you in this room would feel intimidated to take a listening identification test where a piece of music's played and you have to shout out the title and composer, right? Yeah, very intimidating. And it's no different for my freshman students. So instead of just throwing them into the deep end, um, I've, cr I've tried a few different approaches to helping them learn how to study. And what I've settled on is doing a discussion board on Canvas about how to study for this. Um, other options could be an in-class discussion or modeling the behavior, like doing a video of myself studying for a listening exam. But I found this is, this is better because it makes sure that everyone is participating in the problem solving of how to study for this. Um, in my class, sometimes I have some older students who like maybe miss taking this class at the scheduled time because they went on a mission or something like that. And often they've done this before in other classes. So they're able to share strategies with the younger students. And sometimes the younger students have really innovative ideas. Um, but using this discussion board, I've gotten a lot of feedback from students that it was super helpful to learn how to study for this um, type of exam. We can also incentivize growth mindset. There's always gonna be some who, despite your best efforts towards preparing the students for the exam, just bomb it, right? Maybe they never had to study before. Um, so there's a few different approaches we can have to help students cultivate that growth mindset to do better on the next one, instead of just giving up on your subject completely and calling themselves a failure. So one of these is a, having a cognitive wrapper. Some of you may have heard of this before. It's basically like doing a reflective writing exercise um, about their exam performance, how they studied, what they could have done differently or better. Um, it could also take the form of uh, like some kind of survey, something like that. Any type of reflective behavior based on exams. In the past, I have made this mandatory for all students for the first exam, um, but there were enough students that really excelled on the first exam that I decided to make it an optional activity. Um, and then I either do a completion grade if it's required for everybody, maybe some participation points, or even incentivize it with extra credit on the exam. Even one point of extra credit is gonna really make a lot of students excited to do this. Um, and Again, while we are incentivizing things, we're teaching students how to learn better. So sometimes it can come across as a little bit babying, but some of them, they really need that to build those skills that they've never been introduced to before. So other types of assessments like papers and presentations, these can be really um, intimidating to a lot of our freshman students, either because it's a type of activity that they've not done before, or the scope is different. For example, maybe they've written a two or three page paper, but they've never written a 15 page one. So having ways for the students to succeed in these uh, types of assessments or projects is really essential. There's a few different approaches that we can use to creating these assignments in the first place. And then I'll talk in a minute about how to communicate the expectations with the students. So first is studies show that if we vary the types of assignments, I mean assessments that we have during the semester, we're more likely to have our students succeed. We have some students that are really comfortable with writing and others who have labeled themselves bad at writing. 
We have some students who are really comfortable speaking publicly and others that are extremely shy and will not say a word in front of the class. So having different types of assessments will make it more possible for all types of learners and students to succeed. Another thing I find a lot is students have, aren't thinking critically about why faculty are making certain choices in their courses. They say, oh, I have to write this paper, rather than saying, I wonder why they're having me do a paper rather than an exam. Um, so giving a rationale when describing the activity to students can really help it stop feeling like busy work. For example, my world music class, um, right now students are doing final project presentations. I used to present this as, we're researching music in India go. And they were like, oh, why do we have to do this stupid thing? Not relevant to me. I reframed the project as your best friend is going on their mission to India and they need, they're a music major. They need to know what they're going to expect there. How are you going to share your knowledge with your friend? And this has made it a lot more engaging in terms of watching and listening to the presentations. It's much less boring but it's also given the students a little more investment because many of them have been on missions or will go on missions or are gonna travel internationally just to like hang out. And it helps them engage with that way of thinking. How am I going to travel to a different country and engage with the music there? And if possible, when we're thinking about what kind of act, a project to give, we can think about incorporating real life problems from our field. Um, so this can be much more engaging than just a theoretical example, but it can also be really challenging. Sometimes students wanna solve the problem. I do an activity about cultural appropriation in my class. It's like a two week project that we do in class. And some want to come out in the end saying, this is cultural appropriation, this is not the end. And it's not an issue that one can really put that black and white line on. Right? There's definitely a big gray area in the middle. So reminding students of this, our freshmen are often wanting those right or wrong answers. They're uncomfortable with the gray area. So reminding them repeatedly that we're not solving the problem here, we're exploring the problem. As uh, Sam Clem said to me, um, they're not gonna solve the issue of gun control in a four source paper, which is very true. Um, we can use these real life problems to challenge our pre-existing beliefs as well as our expand our worldviews. So one example of how to do this would be to choose a challenging topic and have them do the project based on one side that they get to choose. And then guess what? You gotta do it again on the other side. Um, I also like assigning sides randomly so there's no personal viewpoints being expressed. For example, in cultural appropriation, there's a lot of political viewpoints that go into that conversation. So instead of um, having like fear-based or emotion-based responses, I want fact-based responses. So what I've done with that is assign people to sides alphabetically and point out that your group, it's a completion assignment, participation points only, but your grade will go down as a group if people are sharing their opinions rather than fact-based responses. So obviously in different fields, this is going to be different, um, but this is one way to challenge students' worldviews. And again, this brings us higher in Bloom's taxonomy because we're thinking about these challenging topics and we're not trying to have a black and white right or wrong answer. So once we assign these projects, there's a lot of time management problems that our students have. So how can we help them with that? So one way we can help is by having a transparent assignment design. I'll have a resource about this on one of my final slides. And that just basically means your assignment is structured as clearly as possible. So we've got step-by-step -step guidelines. First, find out what this vocab word means. Second, research it in this context. Third, write an outline, etc. And to make it as clear as possible, we want to really um, have every detail that we can there. So examples would be time estimates. How much time should they expect to spend on this portion of their final project? Um, and having deadlines for each step is also essential. I know we've all had things where it's like, oh, it's still a month from now. Oh, I'm, I'm going to submit for that you know, that article that I've been working on. Oh, here it comes, closer, closer. And then 
panic sets in and our students are no different. So having those, those clear deadlines for each step of the process, when your peer review is due, when your first draft is due, when your outlines due, these can really help students learn better time management. Other great things to include would be frequently asked questions. This could be in a discussion board, but I found students don't engage with that very much. So instead, you could have a link, click here to um, see frequently asked questions, examples of A work, from previous semesters with student permission and grading rubrics. I try to include a grading rubric with everything so students, it's not a mystery why you got a B or whatever. Um, I also like to give time in class to work on projects. A lot of times students are resistant to attending office hours um, and if you're right there in class, then they can just ask the question right there and it helps them see you as more approachable. Um, especially if there's a group element to the project, that in-class time is really valuable. And students that are, have weak time management skills, it helps them feel like the workload is much more manageable if they've had that in-class time. I also like to give um, extra credit and other opportunities for doing things that they should do anyway. So for example, using resources like coming to office hours or going to the writing center, I often will give like a point or two of extra credit on an assignment if they visited the writing center. Number one, it makes my job grading it much less painful, um, but it also teaches them that there's no shame in going to the writing center and it's a really valuable on-campus resource that they have access to. I also sometimes, depending on the assignment, offer opportunities for revision. So I have some conditions for that. For example, they must have turned in the first draft, like the first version on time. Um, they have to have changed the things that I said were wrong in that first submission. And I also usually say, if you have a 95% or higher, you can't do a revision because then you get those grade grubber students. And by averaging these grades, then it offers students the chance to, again, develop that growth mindset and work towards um, a better learning um, attitude that will serve them well in the future. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I hope that you took away some ideas and strategies that you can implement in your own course um, in any of these categories, how to organize it, how to um, present the ideas of the organization to your students, how to create community in the classroom and then also your exam format and the way that your projects are structured. So, does anyone have any questions for me? Yes. I have a short one. Oh, yeah, we have to use the microphone for the Zoom people, yeah. So just a quick question about your signing. Random groups, how do you actually do that? Do you do it in Canvas or? I need some tips. <laughs> okay, some, I've done different ways, as I said. Sometimes I do alphabetical, and that's a really easy way to do things. Um, I've also used the random group feature in Canvas. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that can be good. Um, I also sometimes just go in Banner, and I just make these, I make groups that are like, here's majors, and I just say, okay, all the biology majors go here. All the you know music education majors go here, and I just sort them, and then I use that to kind of, okay, put one of each of these in a group, put one of each of these in a group. It is a little bit time intensive, but um, if I do a group like that and then an alphabetical group and then a count off one through 10 and then start again at one, you know, you can kind of mix up your strategies and then it won't be too time intensive and you'll get a nice mix that's different every, every group. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. cool. Thank you. I really love your idea with like the unconventional test of how you like have the three facts that students have to share. Um, I'm curious with the discussion board that you've done there where they share study strategies, what are some study strategies they came up with for preparing for that type of test? So the, the discussion board about study strategies is more for the listening portion of it. So my tests have 50 points, nine points are listening based. Then there's a map because it's world music. We got to know what continent we're on, right? And then the remaining 36 are the points about um, facts. So the discussion board is more about the study strategies for the listening specifically. But we do talk in class about ways to get organized mentally for the fact-based portion of the test. And so things that I do is I say, okay, we have six 
content-based classes in this unit. So if you only need three main facts for your test, maybe one good way to study <laughs> would be to have one major fact from each class. And then, you know, it, from your notes, when you're studying for your test, go through and come up with at least one fact from each day, right? So then you're not going to be also, oh crap, what was my third one, you know? I also, at the beginning of the semester, when they're getting used to this format, I'll have them do things, turn to each other, share what a fact is that you learned that you could put on your test, and what would the three details be. I share examples, um, you know, kind of when I'm wrapping class up of like, okay, so today we talked about this, um, here's some main points. What could we say about each of these main points that might be good to put on a test? So just kind of sharing ideas about that um, with them and helping them organize. And um, I also give them examples a lot of times of facts that don't count because it does have to be a fact about music. So for example, they might say, Ghana has a population of whatever. Okay, who cares? And so I give that as an example of this is not a valid fact. That counts as zero points if you put that down. Um, or, okay, saying that, not a valid fact. But then if you say there's a huge diversity of music in Ghana because of the population of X, which is spread between rural and urban populations, each of whom has their own musical styles. Okay, now we've gotten into music. So I like to share a lot of examples of like good and bad. And then when they get the feedback from the first one, then, then they get it even more clearly. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. We do have a question uh, from, from the Zoom chat. Spencer is asking, um, how do you build a reading guide? Oh, okay, so my reading guides, basically first I start with the reading assignment that I wanna give, and then I go through and I write down questions for myself that like, basically if I were highlighting or taking notes on my own reading assignment, what are the things that I would highlight? Or what are things if I were giving a traditional multiple choice test that would be key takeaways from this reading? So I start with that and usually I end up with a list of, you know, 15, 20 questions. And then from there, I kind of parse it down into like, what's the most important things. Um, and sometimes I'll put like a chart, like one of the readings I assign in my class is about um, music throughout the life cycle. So it talks about at birth music and then music at puberty and then at marriage and then at death. And so then I make a little chart. What are the four life stages that have music? What's an example from the text? and then think of an example in your own life. So you're supposed to fill out the chart. Um, so just try the things that you want them to take away from the reading, write a question that makes them write down the thing that you want them to take away. And oh, I should add that, um, I guess you could do it as a Canvas quiz, but I want the students to have it there with them in class so then they can remember the key points when we do a discussions or they can, um, add to that reading guide from the, you know, the notes that they take in class. So I, I don't like to think of it as a quiz, even though it is question based. I do have them do it on paper, like a worksheet, because then it's really easy for my UTF to go around and just check, 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 check when he's checking off attendance. And then they have it there on paper, like there's no scrolling through social media. Oh, I was actually looking for my reading guide, right? So it's just there on paper it's really easy to see if they did it or not. And, um, you know, as we probably mostly know, studies show that writing things by hand aids in retention. And so that's an added bonus there. Other questions, comments? If not, I'll go to my last two slides, which are some resources. So the first is the transparent, well, the transparent assignment design template, I feel like is a really nice uh, resource. I don't love the way it's laid out on the paper personally, so I kind of have adapted it myself, but the steps towards um, success in those larger scale assignments, I found to be really helpful. And I don't know if um, we can make the PowerPoint available so the link's clickable for participants today or? 
Um, maybe we could we could put it in the when we send out the YouTube link, we could oh, okay. include that there. Okay, so you'll have access to this link, but you can probably also find it if you just Google transparent assignment design, it might come up. Um, I would highly recommend any of you who are not familiar with the AU course to take that. It's, it was really um, inspirational and incredibly helpful um, coming from the perspective of someone who didn't have pedagogical training. And then here's a few more sources that um, I found from my notes from my AQ course that were the most relevant to the things I've shared with you today. So, thank you all Perfect. for being here. Yes, thank you so much. That was fantastic.